Um, it was very, a very, very interesting presentation, that, that Michael. Uh, look, we've had three good present, very good presentations, all slightly different angle of, of the meat, meat job, so to speak. We've got some time for questions. Um, if before we start, there's one quick question which I might, might ask, uh, might, might ask Trish, and it probably shows, perhaps that, and Mick Kerr is in the audience, might show my background as an old bull and partial scientist. Um, the sheep. Sheep numbers are dropping down to 71 million. Is there any sense of how that's broken up between wool and, and meat? Um, do you get a sense of that? Or is it just a general trend in, in, in dropping numbers? And have I asked you a question perhaps I should have forewarned you about? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't really um, know that. Um, I mean, there's, there's been a, a major change I guess in the in the sheep job as you call it over the past couple of decades and more towards a dual purpose sheep. Um, there was I think over the last couple of years a move back into into merino um, and, uh, and and uh, an increase there but um, yeah I think most of the industry is probably dual purpose. Yep. Any questions from the the back there, if you could just perhaps state your name and your organisation, is there a... Um, yeah, well, certainly uh, we need to do something about a cost of production, no doubt about it. Um, so, um, and I think probably the simplest way of answering that is it is a horses for courses uh, thing. You know, you need, uh, it, even within China, that, you know, the red wine example is probably a pretty good example. Um, I don't know what the average price uh, of, of red wine in China is, but I bet you it's probably somewhere around a dollar. You know, there's probably a lot of red wine consumed at that commodity level. But obviously, as that economy develops, there's more and more segments that emerge that are more prepared to pay for, uh, for their product. And I think as one of the speakers this morning said, that um, you know, I guess the opportunity in China is there's more, um, uh, not so much the wealthier classes, but the, the average, you know, um, perhaps middle class, even lower middle class, expand, then their preparedness to buy products will exist and they'll want to pay for things and they'll be aspirational. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I guess there, it is, it's, it's a segment by segment approach. I mean, even, I mean, Japan obviously is a concern for us because that's our number one market uh, for beef. Um, but uh, now, you know, China are outbidding Japan for briskets now. So, you know, briskets are going to China. So they're prepared to pay a premium there. A lot of those briskets are going into manufacturing, which then goes into products like uh, hot pot products, which are buy, bought by average people on the street. So I think we are seeing, you know, an opportunity in a number of areas. Um, and you know, you are right though. We, I mean, that we will need to continue to improve our cost of production, but we'll never obviously be able to compete with India and Brazil. So um, the more we can move up up the food chain, so to speak, the better off we'll be. When it comes to pork, I guess um, we never want to take our foot off the gas of productivity improvement, efficiency improvement, but it's, it's absolutely clear we're an industry that depends more on labour than maybe the beef industry does. We are not world's lowest cost producer. Uh, the beef industry is much closer to being that. 
Uh, so when we look at markets like China, China consumes 50 million tonnes plus of pork every year. We produce 350,000 tonnes. The, the tiniest market share in China would be an enormous improvement to our business domestically. So um, that's the way we look at it. China does have premium segments and we would not have to get too much of that with a reputation coming from, from Australia that you've just heard about that the red meat industry is leveraging that would apply just as well to poor. Uh, we definitely see it as a premium opportunity, not a volume one. Any other questions? <clears throat> perhaps if I can ask one of, um, perhaps of, of Andrew and Michael, um, and, and Trish also. One of the, one of the statements that, that Andrew made was that um, large Australian, in Australia our food cultures change and therefore we consume more pork and more, more poultry, um, mainly due to price change. Is that underselling the changes the industry has made in actually changing the product to a constraint and changing consumer preference as well? It's not just price itself? I think it's, I think it's a mix. Um, you know, we, you have to remember we've come from a food culture that was driven in the very early days from our, our English roots, our UK roots very much pastoral based industries. Australia is really well suited to with huge areas of, of grazing land, really well suited to beef and lamb and that's what we used to eat, big licks of it. Um, as, our, as our community has diversified in terms of where it's come from, we've had a lot of more Mediterranean influences and more recently a lot more Asian influences, they have introduced different types of food cultures that a lot of Australians, even from traditional uh, backgrounds, have embraced. So there's lots of different things happening in the dynamics of where protein is consumed. And price is a part of it, but absolutely there's cultural influences um, from immigrants, but right across the community as well. Uh, they, they have that influence. I think it's a good, good point, Andrew. Um, a statistic that I saw um, was that 10% uh, of Australian population is either from Asian or of Asian parents, and obviously, um, you know, for our perspective in our industry, um, you know, that, that com comes with high consumption of, uh, particularly, chicken and pork. So that puts pressure on on uh, consumption of, of beef and lamb for sure. Um, and I think obviously there's been a, a, a big growth. I mean, my previous uh, employer was a big supplier to the food service trade. I mean, that in, in the past 20, 30 years, the food service trade has, has developed enormously. And there's a whole wide range of cuisines that we all eat through through restaurants. So that provides opportunity. I was, I was telling Andrew before that the company I worked for, we just couldn't get enough pork ribs that we were cooking and supplying them to um, uh, to restaurants. And uh, you know, it's the most expensive part of the carcass. Was, was fifteen dollars a kilo, uh, so um, you know, that's just an example of, of the, the change in dynamics. I wonder whether also um, convenience has played a um, sort of a large role in you know, changing um, our, our want for chicken, for instance. You know, moving away from the weekly roast or the the special special roast chicken every you know a few weeks or whatever, and uh, you know throwing a chicken breast on the in the pan is the easiest thing and very quick. And the same with pork. I think pork has moved that way in a big way too. And beef, I guess. Yeah, yeah beef moves, has moved that way too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now that's one of the biggest challenges we have, I mean, in the domestic market, obviously. And we do get criticised from time to time from various parts about the um, decline in consumption of beef. But um, uh, I would point out, A, that it has stabilised in recent years, um, and B, uh, we have a very, very, you know, you can see the demand that's coming from export markets. So product will continue to flow to, to where the price commands. That's just uh, the way it will be, and that's great for our industry. Uh, but still, we, we still work very hard in the domestic market to maintain um, consumption of, of beef and lamb, and, and you know, people have to pay a premium for those products. So we have to justify why they should be paying a premium. Thank you. Uh, question in the centre there.
I said to Michael earlier, I enjoy a good steak occasionally. <laughs> um, I think uh, I think there's merit, Mick. Um, we don't have to sell our products to Australian consumers because they love them, and we really do across all of agriculture com have to compete in a relatively minor way with imports. It's a bit different in my industry where I have a huge problem with imports, but across all of agriculture, it's not a big deal. So I don't think there needs to be a marketing campaign to our domestic consumers that you, they need to buy Australian. They already do that, by and large. I, I think it's more about we need to sell the attributes of Australian agriculture in a much more positive sense, uh, in a much more united sense, so that the, we are not such a soft touch individually and through our various sectors to interest groups who have a different agenda to, to ours and have different sets of values to ours. Um, and occasionally it gets very frustrating for agricultural industries to be, uh, for others to have, it, have their way with us in a very negative sense. And we have failed to really put together a model for us to act jointly and in, co in, a, in a coordinated fashion to really sell, sell our story and sell our story broadly. Um, so I think the, those markets that are going to be so or much more receptive to our messages about food safety and traceability and the standards thing are likely to continue to be our international markets, but we certainly have a different story to tell domestically. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Oh, sorry, would you like to? Yeah. Um, it is an interesting question. Uh, we obviously invest uh, in you know, convincing consumers, as I said, why they should pay a premium for our product and, and, and promoting the convenience factors of it. Um, but we have looked at, uh, and we do do uh, some level of investment in activities such as the Target 100 program that some people may have heard of. Um, and a number of our producers do say to us, you know, people in the cities don't understand what we do. You know, they feel aggrieved. Um, you know, particularly the live export um, issue left a lot of a bad taste in a lot of producers' mouths, um, and they felt that you know the city doesn't understand them. So. We do get pressure from time to time, and we have and we are continuing to look at ways that we could, could um, improve that perception. Um, but I guess it is challenging because when we've looked at trying to pull stuff together, Mick, it, it, you do sometimes when you look at this stuff, you sort of go, so what? You know, you look at, you know, I've looked at a, a range of different campaigns, and most of these have been beef industry, but they could easily be, you know, total agriculture. And you are left a bit, you know, when you put your consumer hat on, you look at it, you sort of go, so what? I mean, I don't know, the, even take the mining industry ads, for example. I mean, I don't know what people here think of those. They're fine, but I look at them and go, so what? Um, and it is a lot of, I mean, I'm talking about advertising here. There's other ways to do things, but ultimately, if you want to get to a mass audience, it is through advertising. That's very expensive. So I, I'm a little bit on the fence, probably, because I can see the merit of it. But then when the sort of, you try to get the rubber to hit the road, um, even in, in our own industry, um, we found it hard to, to find a way to do it where we can convince ourselves that we'd get a return on investment. Maybe it is by teaming up across industries that might be the, the way to do it. <coughs> Thanks very much. Yes?
Did, did everyone hear the question? Sure. Um, it's the, uh, the growth of uh, exports of, of animals out of India into other Asian countries and then, then process, processing that and for that product then to go into Indonesia. We have a lot of difficulty in, in competing, I guess, with very low cost countries like, like India. Our meat processing costs are much higher than many other major exporters in the world. Um, and uh, I mean, if that's the case, we can't compete low price uh, against Indian buffalo meat, then I, I guess we wouldn't be sending to that market. We'd be pursuing higher value markets for us. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you're right. It's, it will put downward pressure on pricing um, at, you know, with commodity product. And um, that's a fact. Um, so for us, we need need to reinforce our food safety systems. You know that that is a key differentiating factor, and ultimately everybody wants safe food. But for the manufacturing market, you know, for the, the huge Buxo wool market in, in Indonesia, you know, there's, there's there's a big demand for that that product. Um, you know, that'll be a low cost protein, uh, very lean that can go into that marketplace. So. But no doubt it'll be a competitor, and we need to focus on those that are prepared, you know, want some more, I guess, assurity that, um, through the production systems that we have that all come at a cost, um, uh, and focus on those markets. At the back there. Yes, is the answer. Um, the, um, in the trade shows we've done over the last 12 months, there's been a huge increase in interest for goat meat in China. And uh, there's a number of suppliers who have capitalised on that and sell, sell, selling you know, a lot of container loads of, of uh, goat, goat meat in, into, uh, into China. Um, I'm not as close to the capacity to supply. It's definitely the biggest issue um, is 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 supply and developing a you know a, a good supply chain for goat meat. So I think that is that is the opportunity. That's generally in the resources we have um, with the Goat Industry Council that we focus on is to try to improve that supply chain. Um, but the opportunity is definitely there. One final question. Yeah, I saw that presentation too, and it was a very impressive one. And I believe there's a lot of um, there's a lot of scope for Australian agriculture to come together to try to to have a concept like that. And I think one of the attractiveness one of the attractive things about the New Zealand campaign is they've actually mixed up their tourism industry with the uh, the image of their produce for export, which is quite quite good and I, I believe that they have fantastic results from their uh, 
um, their campaign. So there's a lot to be done in that area. Australian agriculture has a history of not really working together particularly well, and I think we have to get over that and do much, much better in the future, because it's only then that we're going to be able to pull off things like that. And I really believe that the sum of all the parts is much greater than the, the individual bits. I, I don't think I'd agree with that. I'll have with you. Um, look, we've come to conclusion, it's 3, 3.30, so I'd like to thank everyone for their attendance and their questions. I'd particularly like to thank the three speakers for their presentations today, so please join me in thanking Michael, Trish and Andrew. <laughs>